Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Tribal Nation Summit panel on substance use and mental health in tribal communities. Navi toa hawe Mpovi, Navi Americana hawe Elizabeth Reese, na nambea wenge weang omu. It's nice to, to meet you all. My name is Elizabeth Reese. Um, it's also Yompovi in my traditional language, Tewa. I'm from Nambe Pueblo, New Mexico. I think there's some, yes, hello. I'm like, the Pueblos are back there. Oh, hey, guys. Hi, Governor. It's good to see you. I didn't, um, but thank you all so much uh, for coming. Um, so this panel, oh, for those of you who, who haven't, haven't met me, I'm, I've been running around with a chicken without a head for the last two days. Um, uh, I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for Native Affairs at the White House on the Domestic Policy Council. Um, and, you know, myself along with the Tribal Affairs Director at the White House Intergovernmental Affairs Office, Rose Potosky, um, are, you know, part of the team that puts on this event every year um, and, you know, welcomes you all to Washington, D.C. and decides, you know, what the substance of uh, this two days is really going to be. So thank you all so much. Uh, for coming um, and making this all possible, and you know, feel free to reach out for me to me anytime uh, when you have questions um, about the White House's agenda when it comes to Native policy. So now to move on to this panel. So this panel will highlight some of the major progress under the Biden Harris Harris administration's mental health and substance use disorder agenda. The administration has hear, has heard clearly from tribal leaders about the opioid crisis. We know that substance use is also tied to broader concerns with mental health and well-being in our communities and to questions about how to keep our communities safe. Today, we'll hear from administration leadership on some particular milestones and the path of, that we're taking on the future when it comes to addressing substance use disorders and behavioral health resources while also hearing key perspectives from tribal leaders who fight for the health and well-being of their people every day. As this panel is, you know, might be shorter, we will see how we go in terms of questions, but if there is time, we will have mic runners to answer questions from the audience. I'd first like to allow our tribal leaders to introduce themselves. First, we have Martin Harvier, President of the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community, and then next, quickly, Tony Hilaire, Chairman of the Lumi Nation. Lumi Nation, sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Skukshadik, Kamdum, Ani Abchugik, Martin Harvier, President for the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community. I just want to say it's an honor to be part of this panel and the discussion that will take place. You know, and I'll, I'll just state in preparing uh, some of my comments, uh, I couldn't help think about decisions that individuals we make individuals that would be talking about, lives that we're talking about. Uh, I'll just share with you, I know I'm limited on time, but I, I'll just share with you, um, we have a journey to recovery uh, for our men and women of our community that are going through substance abuse. And one, one afternoon I was leaving the office and I seen a group of the men and I went back and I just told them to, to keep moving forward and what they're doing, make changes in their lives. And I told them, I said, you know, and I think all of us need to think about that in growing up. I know somebody stated their age yesterday. I'll state this month, I'll turn 64 years old. My younger years, I made some decisions that probably weren't good decisions. But I told them the difference between me and you, you got caught. I didn't. And a lot of times we have to think about that decisions that we made and now people that are going through issues. We got to think about that. Things that we, we might be uh, facing ourselves if things would have turned out differently. So uh, great for this opportunity to sit on this panel and hear the discussion take place. Thank you for this opportunity. Aitz Kuchil, Nostalgia CEM. Good morning, my, my dear friends and relatives. My name is Tony Hilaire. Uh, my name is Satsumton, uh, chairman of the Lummi Nation uh, tribe located in, in Washington State. And just to follow along with my tribal leader, and I guess in a little advice, don't give a tribal leader an open mic. To, <laughs> we'll, we'll, take, we'll take all the, the time up if, if we have to. Um, but what's on my heart today is, is just asking our, ourselves, is it our time? Is it our time to really address this issue head on, uh, the challenges between uh, harm reduction and tough love uh, for our people? And uh, it, are we ready to do this? And if we're not, then 
Uh, we need to go home and apologize to our children. But if we are ready, uh, then we need to step up and, and work together as partners to uh, really make some good changes in, in this world. And, and for us at Lummi Nation, we refuse to accept anything less than what was envisioned for us by our elders and ancestors. And we're going to keep working hard to, to get us there. Uh, we, um, we, we just wanted to uh, come here and, and let everyone know that uh, we love you all. And uh, especially um, in, in this fentanyl crisis that we're in, uh, we have to stick together. And we're looking forward to this conversation this morning and how we can uh, better work together between uh, tribes and, and the federal government. Haishka Siam. Kunda, thank you. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce our federal panel. So first we have Rahul Gupta, director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. Next, we have Andrea Palm, the deputy secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. And last but not least, Vanita Gupta, associate attorney general for the Department of Justice. So now on to our first question for Chairman Hilaire. Could you share some of the substance use and behavioral health challenges in your community specifically, and how the federal government can play an even more supportive and effective role in working with tribes to curb substance use and improve behavioral health? Yeah, thank you. Uh, really thankful for, for that question. There's, there's a few things. And uh, first, uh, before we you know, go, go into what the, the challenges are, uh, it's really important that we um, acknowledge and uh, remember the resilience that, that we have a, as a people, the, the foundation and the legacy that's been laid, laid out for, for us next generation of leaders uh, to get us to where we are today. You know, we have much more than we've, we've had. And uh, yes, we are a people who have overcome uh, genocide and the historical traumas. And it was well said uh, this morning in the opening prayer that uh, we want historical healing. And, and that's where we're at today. And so, yes, they are challenges, but uh, we're resilient and, and we're always going to be here fighting for, for what, we, what we need. And we see it, we see the hope in the, the children yesterday in the, the uh, cultural uh, performance that, that was up here. Uh, so long as we have our, our culture, we're, our way of life, we're, we're always going to be okay. Uh, but we have to uh, match up to the severity of this, this fentanyl crisis. And so um, we, we say all that just to, to bring up some of the challenges. The first is uh, that these are our, our relatives. You know, these, this isn't just a stat or data. Uh, it's not just a number. Uh, these are the people that we grow up with. These are our, our mothers and fathers, our children and grandchildren uh, that are dying in an overwhelming amount uh, due to fentanyl uh, overdose. And so that's one. Uh, the second is uh, the um, uh, severity of, of this issue uh, needs to be uh, risen up to, to the highest level of government possible. And uh, for example, we lose more people to fentanyl overdose than we do uh, COVID-19 at Lummi Nation. And we declared a, a state of emergency and a, a fentanyl crisis. And uh, we believe that the, the federal government, that President Biden and the administration should declare fentanyl uh, a national uh, emergency so that we can tear down uh, these barriers that are hindering our ability to take care of ourselves. For example, we shouldn't have to compete with our brothers and sisters across this nation just to get what we need to take care of ourselves. And I think the executive order that was signed yesterday is a good step uh, toward uh, that direction. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we, we are in um, a big challenge is, is detox and, and facilities. Uh, the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs has been holding uh, hearings and, and yesterday uh, some of the federal agencies brought up uh, some of the needs for, for tribes, but um, the main thing is having the ability to construct and build the, the facilities that we need. And uh, for us, we, um, uh, we did an immediate drug interdiction on a reservation, started checkpoints, got canine units uh, out there to get as much drugs off of the reservation as possible. And with that came uh, the huge need for harm reduction. We uh, opened up a... We, repurposed the modular uh, the, and, and made it a 24-7 uh, stabilization center and expansion of medication-assisted treatment and our uh, opioid treatment program. And so uh, when we started our drug interdiction, our beds became completely full, uh, which highlights the need for, for more facilities, treatment access, resources, and especially secure withdrawal management and stabilization facility. 
And, and so uh, that's a huge challenge is, is being able to, to build um, the facilities that we need to, to take care of ourselves. Uh, in addition to that, as we work through uh, addressing the drugs on our reservation, uh, jurisdiction was, uh, was a huge issue. And I only bring that up, it's, it's related but not. Uh, we believe that us as a government, as a tribal government, uh, we, we carry responsibility. If we're able to, to help, then we have the responsibility to do so and to give our people that are struggling with addiction a fighting chance. And a part of that is getting drugs off the reservation. And uh, given our uh, geographic area, uh, a lot of jurisdiction issues are, are coming up. And so we're, we're working with uh, Congress to, to enact a bill that acknowledges and recognizes tribal sovereignty and jurisdiction. And so those are just a few. Uh, this uh, fentanyl crisis is very complex. It takes uh, prevention, intervention, and rehabilitation. Uh, we also uh, believe in the need for us to come together. Uh, and in Washington State, we hosted a, a tribal state opioid summit uh, to really bring forward recommendations for uh, Washington State administration and uh, legislation, uh, some fixes that need to take place so we can work better together. In addition to that, uh, our Tulalip tribes in Washington State, shout out to Chairwoman Gobin, who's here. Uh, today uh, hosted a, a national uh, fentanyl summit uh, this year uh, in collaboration with the uh, National Indian Health Board and uh, uh, some of the White House staff and uh, NCAI as well. And from that uh, gathered a, a report that uh, really lays out some key recommendations in all of these areas that touch the fentanyl crisis. And so we really, really recommend uh, our tribal leaders to uh, look at that report. It'll uh, continuously be uh, worked on it and sent out and communicated across Indian country. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The the next chap question is for Director Palm, or sorry, for uh, Associate Attorney General Palm. Uh, sorry. Apologies for Dep Deputy Secretary Palm. <laughs> uh, given the mission of HHS. I've been called worse. I <laughs> <laughs> this is the, the challenge with having so, many, so much engagement from across the federal government is all of these titles. Um, but so given the mission of HHS and its obvious role in supporting the mental and behavioral health of communities, including tribal communities, can you share how HHS has been working across its different components and working with other agencies and partners on improving mental and behavioral health for tribes? Thank you for the question. Thank you for having me here today. It's a pleasure to see all of you and have an opportunity to, to spend some time on this topic. Um, obviously, um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is, is big and deep and wide, and our components all have a connection to behavioral health in some way or other. And so it's really important for me as a leader uh, at HHS to help make sure that we are lifting up and looking across and doing the, the work of putting the people that we serve, including tribal communities, at the center of what we do. And behavioral health is, is a critical piece of that work. I think the way we think about making sure that behavioral health is part of healthcare and that it no longer, uh, uh, that we, we no longer accept it as a separate thing is a really critical piece of how, again, we think about people as whole beings and that their needs uh, are well beyond what we think of as traditional healthcare, but that we really need to incorporate the behavioral health pieces. And so whether at HHS, your CMS, your, your SAMHSA, your IHS, your, our administration for children and families, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you have uh, a role to play in making sure that we're doing this behavioral health work in a less siloed, more comprehensive way. And so we've constructed ourselves internally to facilitate that. Uh, we have, um, a, a, a leadership coordinating council. We have organized around subcommittees, including opioids, including suicide prevention, including some of the youth mental health, some of the larger pieces of this puzzle that we are facing as a department and as a nation. And so we, we're working very hard to, to, to do the work of making sure that our component agencies are working well together. But I also think it's important uh, while the federal government is uh, larger, obviously, than any of its single parts, practically we can't all be under one roof. 
but how we think about reaching across to other agencies to do this work is equally important. So whether it's the work that IHS is doing with the Veterans Administration to think about cultural competency uh, in serving Native veterans, or whether um, it's the way we work across um, uh, with the Department of Housing and Urban Development when we think about housing insecurity and the cross-section that it has with behavioral health. Uh, there are a variety of ways and, and, and many more that we uh, should and do think about um, our, our telebehavioral health agreement with um, the Department of Interior so that we are providing that kind of service in BIE schools. Again, Opportunities for us to do the work better and differently and break down silos are really important parts of the challenge that the president has given to us uh, in under his umbrella of really transforming behavioral health. And, and we are really happy to be a part of that work um, and really want to challenge ourselves to do it better. As we think about tribal work specifically, uh, we look at some of our recent initiatives, things like our 988 uh, suicide Prevention Lifeline, where we have invested uh, ab about 18 million to make sure that tribal communities have access, again, to culturally competent, informed crisis intervention services through 988, or um, things that we're doing at CMS or other parts of HHS to really ensure that we are pushing uh, tribal-specific programs and opportunities forward uh, to fold into the larger work uh, that we're that we are doing. But but I'll stop there since I know that there are many others that need to weigh in. There's a lot, and I could go on, but I I will refrain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the the next question is for Director Gupta. Could you tell us more about the Office of National Drug Control Policy's role, and in particular? Uh, what you guys are doing to help curb substance use and improve mental health for tribes and Native communities. Thank you, and I want to really recognize the importance of all the colleagues here and the tribal leaders sitting. Um, we've had a lot of conversations previously, and it's so important. Uh, you've heard the president and the vice president speak yesterday about the importance of sovereignty, importance of self-determination, um, it is so critical for this administration and from the White House perspective that we respect that we move forward when it comes to crisis as such as the opioid epidemic and the fentanyl crisis. Um, I can tell you that uh, we know that um, you know, some of the hardest hit communities in the country right now are your, your people. And we also know that when we talk about having treatment access, having naloxone, the antidote available, um, it is one of the f uh, areas where it's least dispensed, and we want to change that together. Uh, it is fortunate that, uh, that even a crisis like the fentanyl um, epidemic and opioid epidemic is actually bringing us together closer in order to solve the problem. So, um, you know, as I've traveled, especially this year, uh, we were at the Fentanyl Summit and we were just talking about how jam-packed it was. Um, and to Lelip uh, uh, Reservation that I went to, I, I mean, not only the, res uh, the, the summit had over a thousand participants and overflow, but when I traveled to the hospital, to the clinic, to see people who were being taken care of, um, I saw where um, the, the challenges were there in real life. Similarly, at the uh, Tana Otham uh, uh, nation that we traveled to, and I have drove with the uh, shadow wolves themselves and seen the work that they do in partnership with the federal law enforcement and Haida, it is critical. Um, I've got two messages that I want to convey. First, um, we heard you at the summit uh, on opioids about the need for more coordination, the need to get more responsive in terms of cutting the red tape. And I think you've seen the president sign the executive order as a result of that. It is critical that uh, as partners, uh, we, we take that seriously. Um, in addition to that, you know, when I was at the Tulalip uh, reservation, I was aghast because uh, there uh, we were paying, you were paying, $80 a kit for naloxone. Um, and when we went back, we had conversations with our state colleagues, and guess what, today, um, you're not paying, you're paying zero. 
because those federal resources are now flowing through the state to you. And we want to hear more about that because uh, one thing we can do is help solve these issues when they come up, but we, uh, it's difficult when we are not aware. So please reach out uh, if there are challenges like that. Second message is, you know, uh, substance use disorder and addiction is a lot more than just treatment, right? It's about recovery, it's about housing, it's about transportation, childcare, economic development, job, education, so much more. And that's where the president's national drug control strategy really calls for an approach that is beyond only treatment. And we work in my office as a coordinating body to make sure that we're um, harmonizing all of those aspects. So uh, we want to think like that. We've recently talked to you know, big companies like Google are now recovery-friendly workplaces, and as well as small businesses all across the nation. We want to make sure that more people have that economic opportunity, to not just uh, be able to live and survive, but actually do well and thrive. So uh, with that, I will say that uh, please reach out, and we're happy and thrilled to be here. Thank you. Our next question is for Associate Attorney General Gupta. Uh, as we know, many tribal communities are struggling with the impact of substances on their communities, as we've also heard affirmed by our panelists so far, and that it's tribal governments who are often on the front lines of the work to address these challenges. Can you tell us about the work of the Department of Justice to support tribal courts as they navigate this crisis and any of the promising practices that you may have seen? Sure, let me just start by saying what an honor it is to be here among all of you today. Thank you for coming to this meeting in Washington. Uh, we know we have so much left to do and so much work to do and things to learn from. And it is learning and hearing from all of you that we are actually able to adjust what we are doing wrong and able to fill gaps in a way that supports tribal solutions for tribal problems and supports and uplifts tribal sovereignty, so thank you. I'm also so honored to be sharing the stage with leaders who've truly committed their careers to trying to get at these very entrenched problems which seem to have become worse with new emerging faces to it. As somebody who has family members who have cycled in and out of jail because of substance use, addiction, and co-occurring mental health disorders, this is a set of issues that hits very close to my heart and home. And I know that as a country, we have so much work to do to actually improve access to services, and that for tribal nations, the lack of access and the barriers that exist, the lack of funding and support and infrastructure is that much worse. Uh, and so we know that we are not here just to lift up best practices, but also to understand that this is an urgent crisis. Uh, it is one the pandemic made worse in many of our communities and that we have a lot of work ahead. I will say that as we think about you know, tribal solutions to tribal problems uh, and, and think about how the federal government can support tribal solutions, I traveled uh, to the Mille Lacs Band um, uh, of Ojibwe in Minnesota. Uh, it was early summer and then to Alaska uh, in the early fall where I got a frontline view of the ways in which uh, the healing to wellness courts are operating in different communities, but also some of the real challenges and need still in, in support. The Justice Department is obviously in the fentanyl crisis doing everything that we can to cut off the supply chain, cartels in Mexico and companies in China, et cetera, but we are also taking what I heard very loudly and clear, clearly the kind of prevention, intervention, uh, recovery treatment approach to, and we have to support the whole bandwidth, and it won't be done through the Justice Department alone. It will be done in coordination with all of the agencies and many more here at the federal government. But the Healing to Wellness Court model is one that I think is, was, it was incredibly inspiring to see this model at work in different communities. It's tailored in different tribes, and we have to obviously be recognizing the need to support the kind of unique tribal needs around the country, so it's gonna look different in different places. But these healing circles that take a very comprehensive approach to drug testing, to trying to reunify families that have been hit hard by addiction and uh, maybe where families have been separated because of violence related to addiction and substance use, and seeing the long-term engagement that was really, you know, it's resource intensive, it is, people intensive, it is leadership intensive, but to hear some of the incredible success stories of families that have traveled 
very painful and difficult journeys, but have been reunified. And then the continuous kind of support, even at the back end when families are reunified, understanding the acute needs uh, and stresses that, that people have. And so the Justice Department is providing a lot more funding to support these healing to wellness courts. I'm actually eager to uh, share the stage with two leaders whose tribes are actually getting that the pretty substantial support now from the Justice Department to support more comprehensive uh, approaches to these to these issues. The um, the Salt River, Pima, Maricopa Indian community and Lummi, Lummi communities are, are, we've got different courts that we're supporting in Lummi community and the tribe, we're supporting your DUI courts to be able to provide and reduce recidivism that's related to alcohol dependency. Uh, in Salt River, it's the holistic network of resources to support our young people through community involvement and recovery. Um, we also, and I'll just close out by saying this, VAWA, gave us important tools that the Justice Department is working to implement. And we've done a lot of tribal consultations to make sure that we can implement it in a trauma-informed, culturally appropriate uh, uh, way. And so we've been able now to provide much more funding for special tribal criminal jurisdiction uh, related to crimes that are often fueled by substance use issues but to take not just kind of the enforcement or intervention approach, but to be able to support prevention models through our VAWA implementation. Uh, and we are now um, kind of having heard from all of you because of the different grants that we have at the Justice Department, created a one-stop shop that we, for tribal grants specifically, uh, and it's about to go live in a couple of weeks. I hope all of you will. Uh, consider applying to have these funds to support the models that are working in your communities. We're also doing piloting uh, and trying to support new models that, that tribal leaders are coming up with uh, uh, to, to be able to support recovery and healing uh, and hope. Thank you. Thank you so much. So our next question is for President Hilaire. Uh, could you please comment on the role and importance of traditional medicine and indigenous knowledge in the work to improve behavioral health for native communities? Yeah, uh, thank you uh, for that question. Um, uh, we are uh, self-determining and it is, uh, it's great to see that the executive order was signed in, in, in an acknowledgement of uh, self-determination. Uh, we know how to, how to take care of ourselves uh, as a people and uh, we know and acknowledge the, the need for uh, trauma-informed care. And it, it's uh, a way of um, uh, merging the um, much needed uh, health care services to, to our people, especially those that are struggling with um, uh, substance abuse and uh, mental health and, and uh, uh, the addictions and negative aspects of this world. Uh, we um, uh, really believe that the, the, one, the 1115 waivers uh, need to be uh, addressed as well as the uh, uh, create some sort of uh, reimbursement model uh, for traditional healing practices. Uh, that will allow uh, us tribes the, the ability to support uh, these practices. It's, it's much needed and it uh, really comes down to, uh, to trust. And uh, it was mentioned uh, a couple of times already during the summit, you know, we're, we're overcoming this uh, uh, historic trauma and uh, the genocide that has happened to us and uh, our, our need to, to decolonize, and it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. uh, but given you know our track record, given the amount that we do across the nation, uh, it should be a, a no-brainer to, to to trust that tribes uh, know how to take care of uh, of ourselves. And and so that's that's one. Um, and uh, we we really really uh, believe that um, the the history of our our people pre-treaty. Uh, it shows just how strong we are and uh, our ability to um, continue that, that way of life at, at, while we're also fighting for uh, our treaty rights and the ongoing threats uh, to our way of life can be, can be very challenging. And uh, just real quick, I, I wanted to um, acknowledge uh, uh, Councilman Nick Lewis. He's the uh, Lummi Nation Council member and as well as the, the vice chair on the National Indian Health Board, uh, chair of the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board, and newly elected to NCEI secretary. Everything that's being talked about tonight, uh, right now, uh, in regards to the summits and, and bringing everyone together, it 
it's a heavy lift and it takes a lot of uh, great leadership. And so I wanted to, to recognize him as well. And um, uh, everything that's being said from the fellow panelists here, uh, we do need to, to work together and uh, understand each other. That's the, one of the best things we can do is, is uh, take the time to just be together. And, and that way, uh, hopefully, uh, for our next generations, we'll, we'll be able to, to change the world for the better. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, well, the same question for President, Har for President Javier. So tell us about the work of traditional medicine, about the importance of traditional medicine, and then also how that integrates into questions about the social determinants of health that I know that you've been working on. I appreciate that question. First of all, I just wanted to, again, just thank the Biden-Harris administration for their commitment in this area of uh, health and substance abuse nationwide. You know, and, I, and I emphasize nationwide because, as the good chairman said here, you know, a lot of the things that he mentioned are, are the concerns that we have in our community. And I'll just also state, I, I had 30 Canadian chiefs uh, in our community a couple of weeks ago, and they asked of some of our greatest concerns, and those concerns was substance abuse. And after talking with the, the chiefs, they all said the same things you're experiencing here, we're experiencing in our nations. So it's not something, you know, that it's just the tribes are, are facing here. All tribes are facing this, and it's, a, it's truly an issue that we, we, we need to work harder at. And I, again, I really appreciate the Biden-Harris administration, their commitment. And I was also grateful for the signing that took place yesterday because a lot of the issues that tribe face is just applying for grants and getting the funding they need to start the programs. So it was good with the signing yesterday, hopefully that process will make it easier for tribes to apply and get grants that will help in certain areas. And in saying that, um, you know, we just think everything starts uh, with our youth. It's truly important that we have programs for our youth in our, in our, in our communities. In our community, we have uh, youth services, we have our recreation department. We have the Boys and Girls Club. So in having these programs here, we also made sure that culture was part of it. It's so important to have culture part of any of your programs as far as our young people. It's important to know that they know who they are. At some point in their life, they're going to ask the question, who am I? They need to know. And I'll just share yesterday, I, I, I ran into Cherokee uh, Nation Chief Hoskin, and I thanked him because at the last summit he set up here and he talked about their language program. And when I left here, I went back to our community and I said, you know, I really enjoyed listening to the Cherokee chief talk about what they're doing and how important that is on language. Because it really is, it ties us to who we are. And so in going back uh, and what he, he emphasized, what I heard was 25 years from now, those youth that are just starting these programs will say, I'm truly grateful for the leadership back then that made the commitment that we now have our language that is strong. And that's what we have to do as far as the cultural part of our community is make sure the culture and the language is, is part of all the programs that we, we, we have in our, in our communities to make sure, again, that our, our youth know who they are. But everything really, we need to start with our young people in our community but I also wanted to talk about when somebody commits a crime, the deferred prosecution with an option for rehabilitation instead of incarceration. That's so important. You know, um, again, I, I heard yesterday one of the elders say, when you see people that are having substance abuse, do we throw them away? No, we shouldn't throw them away. You know, unfortunately, somebody introduced them to whatever substance they're addicted to now, and I'm sure they don't want to be in that situation but I just feel like when you have an addiction, you feel like you need that to be normal. And they're not normal. But do you throw them away? No. They're part of our family. They're part of the community, like was mentioned. And we need to make sure that we treat them with love and respect when we see them and, and try to get them the help that we need. And also with our youth, we have a program called Diverting Our Teens. It's for those that are going through probation or even family members that want their teens to uh, go through a, a program the different departments and come and talk to them. Even our uh, Department of Corrections takes them through and, 
you know, see what it's like. If, if you commit a crime and you're incarcerated, this is what it's going to be like. It's not a scared straight program, but it's something that kind of opens their eyes that maybe I got to change the, the way that I'm living right now. So those are some of the programs that we're, we're, we're offering. But also, you know, I, I think it's important for those that have, uh, are going through programs. We have a journey to recovery for our substance abuse and alcohol. When they complete those programs, we've created a little village next to our community of tiny homes. And it's kind of a halfway house for them to get back on their feet before they go back into that same environment that put them in, into the uh, program. But we built that there specifically. Our tribal council wanted to make sure that they were close to the government uh, a campus, their access to programs, to employment, so that it would help them in, uh, in getting back on their feet. So doing things like that uh, is, is important of, of healing our members. And also, I'll just say, you know, as, as tribal leaders, as such as you are, you are looked at up here. You're, you're looked at as a leader. One of the things that we have done as a, as a tribal council is involve those individuals that are going through the program to be part of uh, programs that we have in our community. If, uh, for example, the last Thanksgiving, we, or maybe we shouldn't say Thanksgiving, Giving Thanks Day, we handed out turkeys. And you know what? We invited those members of our journey to recovery to be there with council leaders to hand out those turkeys. And you know, it makes them feel good that they're alongside the leaders of the community. And hopefully that helps them too, uh, again, in helping them in, the, in, their, in their program to wellness. So I really think uh, a lot of what we do is, is important. And, and I'll just say right before the pandemic, I know I'm short on time, we were looking into trauma as we were talking about historical trauma. And, and I'll share with you, there was a, a quote, and I'm, I'm not sure if it was the, the chairwoman Wilma Mankiller, I'm not sure if it's her quote or whose quote, but it was a quote that went something as Native Americans, we cannot see the future with tears in our eyes. And you know, when I heard that, part of me felt like, you know what? We gotta quit crying about what happened in the past and look to the future. But I don't think that's what that meant after thinking about it, because why do we still cry? And that's part of the historical trauma that I think is important for all of us as tribes to try to find out why do we still cry? Why do we still do things that we know aren't right, but we still do it? And some of that has just been passed down from generation to generation, but we need to find out why. And I think that's important. And I think that's why these programs are so important. Again, I wanna thank uh, everybody that's up here and, and their role that they're playing in helping us as tribal communities. So appreciate the time, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'd just like to also take a moderator's prerogative for a second to thank Chairman Javier for sharing that story in particular about um, the the conversation you had with Chief Hoskin last year. That is also something that as some of the organizers of the conference, we really hope that, that that's what happens as well at this summit, that this isn't just an opportunity for you all to partner and build relationships with federal leaderships, but also with one another and to share best practices, take them back to your communities to keep building and, and growing and developing the things that your communities really need. Um, so our last question will be for uh, Deputy, Director, Direct, uh, Deputy Secretary Palm <laughs> uh, uh, before we will open up to audience questions. So please, you know, if you have a question, start, start thinking of it now. Um, so following up on what we have just heard about the importance of traditional medicine and this sort of holistic approach to health, how is HHS working to address social determinants of health and to support better health outcomes in this holistic way? Thank you for the question. Uh, I'll say a, a couple things. One, um, uh, it sort of goes back to uh, what one of the chairmen said at, at the beginning, um, uh, that these, these, are our, uh, these are our family, these are our relatives, these are our sisters, our brothers. Um, and I think when you think about the social determinants of health, it is, uh, and you think of it in that context, it is not rocket science that we are influenced well beyond what we think of as traditional health. And I think it's really important that um, this concept is, uh, it has come to the fore in a way that it is, again, uh, reminding us that we need to think more holistically about the work that we do at the 
U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and more broadly, again, in connection with uh, other parts of the federal government, so that we are um, uh, really putting the people that we we serve at the center of what we do and wrapping around in whatever way that person comes to us um, with, with whatever those needs are. And they're going to live outside of the boundaries or the jurisdiction of any one of our programs or departments. And so how we challenge ourselves to think in a social determinants way, uh, I think is really critical to cracking the nut on, on some of these really tough problems that we're all working on together. And so um, uh, for us, um, we have the privilege at HHS of having a number of components that are important as we think about social determinants and, and health uh, and wellness. And, and so our kids and families programs, our substance abuse mental health programs, our more traditional health care programs, and then of course the critical component of our Indian Health Service who help, who help the rest of us uh, do the work for tribal our tribal communities um, differently and better. And I think you can see that in, for example, the partnership between IHS and CMS to think about the incorporation and the potential for reimbursement for more traditional healing um, uh, methods, you know, beyond, again, what we think of as clinical, traditional clinical medicine. Uh, and CMS is working on a framework that uh, that we will certainly want to do consultation on and we'll look forward to engaging all of you on uh, to think about how we incorporate the, this, the, in the same ways that uh, tribal health programs and urban Indian health programs, some IHS work um, in, in, in trying to move beyond sort of traditional clinical interventions to incorporate in a reimbursable way uh, traditional healing and traditional medicines so that, um, as, as Vanita said, we're... Um, we're facilitating tribal solutions to tribal issues. And so um, that is one example where, where we are trying to think a little differently about the ways in which we incorporate, um, um, you know, beyond our, our traditional way of thinking about how we get to solutions. Um, I, I think the other thing that I would highlight, if I might, is um, IHS's work in the Produce for Prescription program. I think we all understand uh, how nutrition, how food insecurity um, is connected to health and wellness and and um, and traditional foods uh, from that perspective as well. And so uh, we're working to push some money into um, these kinds of programs to facilitate um, really bringing to the conversation uh, in a traditional healthcare setting the importance of nutrition and food security um, to try to get again at a at a different social determinant of health in um, in in a in a more um, a comprehensive way and so we are trying to think innovatively creatively the ways in which we can bring to bear um, our different levers uh, within HHS um, uh, to make sure we are lifting up and putting people at the center of what we do I think if I if I might um, uh, we are um, anxious to sort of facilitate additional conversations about traditional healing, um, understanding that it is a holistic way in which uh, we need to work with you all to approach your communities. Uh, and so we're very excited for the sec what will be the second annual tr uh, Traditional Medicines Summit. The, the White House Council on Native American Affairs uh, uh, will host that for us next year. And we really do look forward to engaging tribal leaders, traditional healers, um, other members of your community and making sure that that event, the agenda for that event, uh, really uh, facilitates a deep conversation about how we think about this work moving forward so that we at HHS and other parts of the government uh, can be responsive and do the work that we need to do uh, to meet your communities where they are as it, uh, as, as it, um, uh, as it is seen through uh, more traditional um, and more holistic, more um, methodologies that really incorporate the social determinants. So uh, I'll stop there, but thank you so much. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so now we have just a few minutes for questions, probably only two is my guess. Um, but I will now ask Tony Dearman and Joanna Blackhair to help identify tribal leaders with questions for the panel and then take them a microphone. Bonjour. 
Niji and Shinabe Duk, Gijaban Quetendish Nikas, Moka Kijika Wuni Big in Dunjiba, Niwi et Bungi Jagna Shimon. Good morning, tribal leaders. My name is Robert Van Zyl. I'm the tribal chairman of the Sakagan Chippewa tribe of the state of Wisconsin. I agree with everything you're saying 100%. This is my issue. What happens to these people that fall through the cracks, through the judicial system, the, the courts and these other, we need to get the towns, the cities, and these municipalities and the court system to work with us instead of competing with us or who's gonna pass the buck on who. We need to be able to, if somebody wants to go into treatment today, we should be worried about getting them into treatment today instead of worrying about who in the hell is going to pay for it. I apologize for my English, but I just want you to know that I think what you're trying to attempt to do is we need to have these states and these counties have some sort of a cooperative agreement the court systems have to work with our court systems. Our sovereignty is just as strong as the state or the county or these municipalities. We have to work together. If we don't work together, all you're saying is fluff. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think, uh, would Associate Attorney General Gupta like to talk about some of the work uh, across jurisdictions that I know the Department of Justice is involved in? Yeah, I mean, I, I thank you for um, what you said. I uh, totally agree that uh, we, if we are working in silos and there's the federal government supporting tribal solutions and these healing to wellness courts, for example, but states and counties are not respecting that structure or are not working together in a coordinated fashion, we're just undermining all of our goals here. And so... Uh, I think we have a lot of work to do in this area, um, uh, and it is something that I will take back to see what can we do at the Justice Department to help bring, create fora, convening areas to actually lift up these healing to wellness courts and to figure out how can states and localities and municipalities, you know, think about these courts and respect the, the tribal solutions while making sure that they are both supportive or that there's, you know, we're, we're speaking to each other and not working at cross purposes. Uh, I totally agree that without that, we will be foundering and won't be able to achieve our, our collective goal. Thank you. Anya, I'm Chugat, Governor Stephen Earl Lewis, Gila River Indian Community. Uh, great panel, uh, amazing tribal leadership up here. Um, but I want to bring to your attention a public health emergency that is happening in real time now, back in Arizona. There's a widespread Medicaid scam resulting in the worst case of fraud in our state's history. Having unlicensed, predatory, sober living homes preying upon our tribal members, luring them to these homes and exploiting their addictions in a massive fraud scheme that is resulting in kidnapping, human trafficking, and death. This is an ongoing humanitarian crisis that needs an all of government approach, including federal agencies to aid the state. The state is unable to address and, and stop this, ex this ongoing exploitation of, of tribal members uh, in our state of Arizona. In fact, um, these predatory agencies are even recruiting and kidnapping tribal members from surrounding states as well. So the state of Arizona ha is, ha is unable uh, to address this, and we need federal support, both in enforcement and also we need resources, just as, you know, as the, the, the consensus of this audience is, uh, for, for support and for resources for on-reservation detox, uh, for all those wraparound services uh, and transitional housing that is needed. Uh, in, in, a, in a critical, drastic, in a drastic way right now. Um, um, doctor, you know, we, we sat on a panel at the first, at the Indian country's first o opioid summit as well, and this situation is deteriorating 
by the month, by the week, and by the day. So on behalf of the other 22 tribes in Arizona and other tribes and other tribal members and our relatives, our relatives that are affected, I lost, I lost a cousin in one of these sober living homes who was left to die. What do I tell her children? We need help. We need help from the federal government yesterday. I, 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 I pray, I pray that, and, and from the bottom of my heart as a, as a, um, as a tribal leader, but also uh, as a relative who has lost, and, and um, my tribal leaders in Arizona have lost loved ones and, and tribal members as well, and there is an ongoing count of missing tribal, tribal, tribal members as well. So please, please hear my well, humble comments. This needs to be addressed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so thank you. We um, unfortunately we, we probably won't have time to get a full response to that question. But I, you know, I think the question is sort of directed at the entire uh, federal panel, and I know that this is something that we are tracking and, and prioritizing, and that we will collaborate and, and speak with you further about afterwards. Um, and with that, so I really just want to thank all of the panelists. Uh, for being here today, and also, of course, all of the tribal leaders um, for being here today. And thank you for being here for this panel. And that's it. Thanks,